Hello everyone, I'm Kate Percival and a huge welcome to you all joining us on day one of the Primary Languages Network's virtual conference, Zoomed Out, a wider perspective of language learning. Over the course of this week, we'll be shining a light on what it means to be multilingual. You'll hear from both children and adults and on day three of our conference, Keynote speaker Dr Sabina Little will be discussing multilingualism and the research that she has done uh, extensively into multilingual families. She's sharing with us not just some fantastic findings but also some of her websites for practical ideas and some of the ways that she would encourage us to embrace all multilingual speakers within our lessons. In fact, she recently shared on Twitter under the hashtag 30 Days Wild Multilingual some really simple but very effective ways of incorporating heritage languages into what we do every day. So you can see some examples here. The one on the left is about the onomatopoeic word splash and whether it is actually a sound word in other languages. The one in the middle, a lovely link between the word for cloud and marshmallow in Spanish, which just creates such a brilliant image. And on the right, you can see a link with nature, which is something that Sabina is very passionate about with her Lost Words, Lost Worlds website, which she'll be talking to you more about. So she invites people to write a poem, a calligram about a butterfly or a caterpillar and thinking about what those words are in different languages as well. So what Sabina's doing is trying to encourage that inquisitive learner and one which will grow in confidence, one which will grow in motivation to, to want to learn more and to want to support um, peers within within the classroom as well. So that actually brings us really nicely onto what I'd like to share with you today in my session. So the three main aims for today. The first one is about growth mindset in MFL, not just for children, but for, for the adults in the classroom as well. Strategies for self-efficacy, so fostering that can-do attitude through some metacognitive strategies that we'll look at as well. So learning how we learn best. And the third element is about cultural capital. So zooming right out from what we're doing um, in terms of uh, teaching words and phrases, but actually we're also teaching about culture and customs as well. And we're aiming to improve life chances for all children by doing this to create global citizens. So we'll start with growth mindset in MFL, which is based, you may be familiar already, it's based on Carol Dweck's research from about 2014. And that it's about mindset in relation to language learning being our own belief of our ability to learn a language. So it can be a fixed mindset where you think you're either good at it or you're not. And if you happen to be not, there's no, therefore no point in trying. Or it can be a growth mindset where you believe that anyone can learn a language given the right amount of support and effort and of course practice. Most learners are somewhere in between and it can change from day to day or it can be different for different skills. So for example, you could have a growth mindset about learning vocabulary, but a fixed mindset about employing grammar rules. We now know that there is, um, we can make change, we can affect change with the neuroplasticity of our brains. So we can, we can bend and shape those connections that are made inside our, inside our minds. And so it, it, it's not just for children as well, it's, it's for us as, as adults and practitioners in the classroom. So from a fixed mindset, we need to be encouraging as much as possible uh, for the most uh, amount of time, a, sw a switch, a flip to growth mindset if we can. So how can we make that shift happen then from fixed to growth mindset? Well, as an adult, the, the first thing we need to do is actually be the role model. So we're all language learners at whatever stage we're at. And I think that counts for so much, doesn't it? On, uh, on a child's awareness, on you know their, their influence, um, on their motivation is, is so impressed upon by adults. We saw a lot in lockdown actually of, of parents saying, I was never very good at Spanish. I'm sorry, I can't help you with the French homework and your home learning. Um, and it's about changing that I can't to I can't yet. So it's possibly just about a shift in attitude from, well, let's work it out together. Let's have a look. Let's give ourselves a bit more practice or let's do a bit more research so that the I can't becomes an I can. Cambridge University recently published some research to, to say that parents and teachers' attitudes towards language learning directly impacts on children's motivation to continue to study languages 
I mean, there's no surprise there. Um, and I know I'm mostly unlikely preaching to the converted when it comes to saying about the benefits of language learning, obviously the communication side of things, a deeper understanding of the world, an opening to other cultures and countries. But we might just need to support our, pol our colleagues in school to make sure that they've also got the same attitude. So understandably, they might be feeling a lack of confidence due to their own language learning experience, possibly only at a secondary school, possibly the memory sticks in the mind of endless vocab tests and, and, and possibly not much more. So what we need to be saying to our children is, hey, maybe I didn't have that opportunity when I was your age. So how fantastic that we can learn this language together. And that's really, really something exciting. We don't need to be the expert the whole time. I think that's quite humbling for children to realise that we are also learners, lifelong learners. Growth mindset doesn't also mean just lavishing praise and being overly positive all the time with absolutely everything the children do. It's more important to feed back to them quite realistically on how to improve. Yes, praise effort. Yes, praise the strategies that the children are using. And yes, of course, praise the progress that they're making. Um, and I love the PLN language detective certificates for this. And if you're not using those already, I would encourage you to have a look at those. They're saved on every lesson, either click to teach or video to teach on the right hand side. You will see a link to the language detective detective certificates and it's something that you can print out and laminate you can make them little postcard size which is something I tend to do and I award one at the end of every single lesson not for attainment but for demonstrating language learning skills or what we call language detective skills skills which I will talk about more later we need to make sure that children know it's okay to make mistakes. So fostering that safe culture in the classroom is really, really important. It's actually how we learn and how we improve and communicate that to the children as well, that by knowing what isn't right, we can work out what is. With languages, we all make mistakes. I make mistakes all the time. Um, and I often have to double check a spelling in a bilingual dictionary or play back an audio file just to check pronunciation. That's absolutely crucial that the children see you do that and know that it's absolutely fine, we're having a go, and it's one of those language detective skills again. Think of that failure not as a um, failure full stop, but as an opportunity to grow and to grow and improve. Often my language detective certificate will be given to somebody who has just stepped out of their comfort zone a little bit and tried something maybe for the first time and, um, and just had a go. Let's move on to self-efficacy now. So this is where we want learners to be helping themselves improve. We might call it independent learners, taking ownership for their learning. And you can see on this scale here, it goes right from the I can't do it right up to I will do it. And we all display self-efficacy in different areas of our life. I know some things that I do with ease and then other things I really need support. I really need to work at them and mistake, mistakes happen all the time, but it's something that I learn from. We want to encourage that seismic shift from I can't do it to I will do it. So it's helping learners become more independent and really take a view on, on what they're good at and what their strengths are, but also what their, their targets are as well. But having that resilience when things are tough, which is hard, it's really, really hard, but to just keep trying and know that they'll get there in the end. It's that awareness of how they learn best, how they memorise words best, how they remember a song best. It's the metacognition. And one element of that that we are very proud of at Primary Languages Network is the introduction of what we call rainbow writing. So building sentences by following the colours of the rainbow, as you can see here, by selecting one from each of the columns, which will make a grammatically accurate sentence by the end of it. And I love the fact that there is a, a separate colour for the full stop, which is really, really important. So um, this is differentiation because it's supporting children that need it. Some might be absolutely fine without it, but it's also it's not putting a ceiling on that task as well. So the children can go as far as they feel confident to do. They might set themselves a challenge and say, well, I'll try and get to the yellow column or the next day I might get to the, the blue column. And there's always scope to um, to write more or to add conjunctions into those sentences to extend them even further. So that was something that we were really, um, we felt quite strongly about that the children weren't um, given a, a ceiling to, to what they were able to achieve. 
Sometimes as adults with years of experience, we forget that children might just need to be explicitly taught how they can become more independent rather than just expecting it to happen. So um, how they can take responsibility for what they learn and therefore what they achieve. So I'm going to share with you some ideas that hopefully will combat any of that learned helplessness that we sometimes see in our classrooms and explicitly teach children that self-efficacy in MFL. Most of which most of you will probably be doing. It might just be that you haven't realised that you're doing it or you haven't necessarily communicated it with the children. That's something that I have um, made a conscious decision to do recently and the results are paying off. So why should we be encouraging that self-efficacy? Well, it helps, to be honest, with all areas of the curriculum. They're just really good learning uh, behaviours to get into. So it helps with all areas of learning. Language learning skills are transferable, so transferable to different languages, to different um, stages of your education. So once children go up to secondary school, they will be taking those transferable skills with them um, and beyond, certainly beyond as well. It's, it's just fair, isn't it? It's fair that all learners have the opportunity to achieve. And with the resources that we're developing and we have developed at PLN, we, we're really proud that actually all children can engage to whichever level they feel is challenging for them. So the example you can see on the screen is, um, in, again, encouraging that self-efficacy. It's a colour coding activity where the children actually identify for themselves different parts of the sentence, be it pronouns, verbs, nouns, conjunctions, and to prove that they know that, they are colour coding all the different types, and then they're using that knowledge to be able to put sentences together and to begin um, actually creating the, their sentence in, a, in a, an, imaginative, an imaginative way. It's actually about sandcastles here, where the conjunction is the, the bridge between the two castles and the pronoun is the flag at the top of the sentence. So we use language learning strategies all the time, and I mean all the time in language lessons. So it's just about communicating those with the children and um, narrating really what the process is of why we're doing different strategies, why we're using different strategies to help memorise words and phrases. So I think the first one has to be the way that we naturally will add actions to the words, the nouns, the phrases that we are learning. And I sometimes will tell my children that it's it's linked with science. So there is some science behind doing something physical with something verbal. And it's called total physical response. It was developed by Dr. James J. Asher. And it's about linking something physical with language, connect, making, making that connection really strong within the brain. So you can Google it, you can find more about it than I've just told you there. And it's something that wows the children, actually, that we're not just doing it for fun. It's not just to look a bit silly. It actually helps the brain remember the words. So um, if they're possibly a little bit reluctant to join in, maybe a year six children, not so keen to do the actions, if you tell them that actually it's going to make them more effective language learners, it's going to help them maybe um, complete the challenge or win the game or whatever is coming next, they might be more inclined to have a go and join in. I have seen this work um, in real life where we've learned actions to do with places in the city. We had boulangerie, so the bakery, and we mimed um, a French baguette. And the next week, it's a tricky word, so I, I was wondering who'd remembered it. And what most of the children found was that they remembered the action first. They remembered it was split into four sounds because we'd done boulangerie, and we'd split up the action that way as well. And over the course of a few a few minutes, the children actually remember the sound boulangerie, boulangerie, and just like magic, it came thanks to that physicalization that we'd put with the word. Song is another fantastic tool to aid memory, and I always say if we could teach the entire curriculum through the medium of song, we wouldn't have retention issues. Um, but certainly with MFL, it lends itself so nicely to song, even if it's not a song that already exists. You don't have to be the best singer, the best composer. You can think of a tune. It could be a pop tune, one of those earworms that you can't get out of your head. And um, if you put your words and phrases to that, that's going to help the learning stick. Fun, joy and laughter. Three key words that we always say are one of the most important things about language lessons. It's learning without realising you're learning, isn't it? So if the children are having fun and enjoying the experience, it's going in without them having to consciously make that effort. So as many games, as much fun, as much enjoyment as you can possibly include. 
Memory hooks, I absolutely love memory hooks and the sillier the better. So they could be mnemonics, they could be little rhymes, little poems, things to help you remember whatever it is you're learning. So with languages, I um, will share my memory hooks with the children and say they're more than welcome to magpie them, but they might not mean the same to them. So I'm, I'm, I'm more encouraged by the children creating memory hooks for themselves because they're more likely to remember them. Um, but discuss them. So hands up and share who's thought of a way of remembering this and that and what's the difference between the two and would someone else like to borrow that memory hook and use it as their own? So an example I'm thinking of is uh, to remember the difference between the pronouns in French. So il for he and l for she. And a year five boy said to me, well, if you put B in front of both of them, you get Bill and Belle. <laughs> so um, that was his way. And actually, I, I sometimes refer to that myself now. Um, I know the children definitely picked up on that. And it was a great way to remember the difference in the pronouns. Words like, I'm trying to think of the, the online gamers in my classes. They have spotted and they've made a link with language with the word fatigue, meaning tired, and the word fatigue in English because on the games that they play, sometimes the characters have levels of energy and fatigue is one of the words that they know from that game. So that's a great link and it's a great memory hook to remember, even if they didn't know the English word fatigue, that it actually means tired in French. Another example is the word for grape in French, un raisin, which sounds like raisin, which of course is a dried grape. So making those links, um, that's understanding of the world as well. There'll be the odd one or two children in the class that didn't realise a raisin was in fact a dried grape, so all good. We try and make learning in language lessons as active as possible, so as many opportunities to be collaborative, to be up out of seats, to be discussing, chatting, designing. Um, again, adding to that fun and enjoyment of the experience. And we know that different learning styles are always represented in our classes as well. So if you've got children that really... Um, benefit from the writing process they might want to overlearn some spellings some new vocabulary just by writing them out seeing how many times they can write out a certain set of vocabulary in a certain time so it might be a whiteboard challenge 30 seconds on the clock let's see how many times you can write it out it might be allowing children notebooks so i know a lot of my year sixes have really appreciated the opportunity to write themselves notes and i i Totally, I'm a note taker and a note writer myself, so I know that that is a, is a way that I learn. It doesn't work for everybody, but it's something that we need to allow children to do if they feel it helps. We cannot expect children to remember a set of words if they've only heard it once or twice. I think research tells you, where, depending where, where you look, that a word needs to be engaged with 12, 25, 60 times in order for it to be assimilated. So we owe it to our learners to give them plenty of opportunities for practice and for recall and for retrieval so that the words are transferred to the long-term memory, which then therefore frees up the working memory to take on more language. We'll talk through a few ideas for recall and retrieval a bit later on. And uh, just to reiterate again, the idea of differentiation, which, um, yes, we have differentiated options of activities throughout the PLM scheme of work, but more importantly, that children feel that they can um, have a go at whatever tasks that they are given with the right support in place, and they're not limited by, by what activity we prescribe that they do. Just a little note about reading. I was recently involved in a focus group for Aston University and a secondary colleague there said how her school was promoting reading in general, so in English, in any language, reading, 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 a variety of different text types, different genre, different languages. And the reason for that was that wider readers make better linguists. And it's something that I guess I knew, but I didn't know I knew. <laughs> so the idea that knowing a word means you understand the concept, so you know what that word means, you understand the idea behind the words. And the more that you know, the more you can make links with other languages. So if you've read about horses and the equestrian um, sport, then you're more likely to be able to pick up the word equitation in French because you can see that language link. If you've learned about space and the moon and the lunar landings, you will pick up that that word lunar links directly with la luna, meaning the moon in Spanish or 
la lune, meaning the moon in French. So, so many links to be made. So an increased vocabulary in English has been proven to directly impact on academic attainment. And that relates directly to, to language learning as well. So let's talk through some of those ideas for opportunities for recall and retrieval. So a warm up idea, the starter of every lesson ideally should be something which refers back to previous learning. So it could be a conversation focus, asking and answering those key transactional language questions. What's your name? How are you? How old are you? Where do you live? How are you feeling? It could be a song that you've done several times, either a greeting song, a counting song, a questions and answers song, a song which recalls different parts of the body with actions. So something which will um, cement the language that's already been learnt and, and get it into that long term memory. Five minute inputs during the rest of the week little and often are so effective when it comes to language learning. They're easy to forget about, not find time for, but my advice on this would be to try and do it at the same time as something else. So lining up, ready to go out to break time or um, coming back in after lunchtime or during the register. I always say register time is the most underused time during the school day and can be put to really, really effective use with revising words that you've learned. So Simple idea just to put your PowerPoint on slide sorter, which you can find uh, at the button at the top of PowerPoint. And once you've displayed all the words that you're learning, just use the register to go through um, as you say the child's name. They reply with one of the words from from the PowerPoint. So in the morning, maybe they might need a bit more support. So you might say the word and they repeat it back to you. By the afternoon, you could slowly take some of that support away. So you could ask them to choose the word they reply with or you could ask them to do it without reading the words. You could take the actual written version of the words and just have the visual left on screen. What's also happening here, as well as every individual getting the opportunity to to say something, the whole class is listening to language roughly 30 times. So uh, definitely beneficial. Something that we call a whole school approach. So when that language is drip fed, drip fed into the rest of school life. So it could be instructions that you're giving to the children during the school day. Look at the board, listen to me, quiet please, tuck your chairs in. Why not make use of the target language for those things that you say several times a day all the way throughout the week? And I think after the first couple of goes, both the teacher's confidence will improve and the children's expectation of, of hearing those instructions in a different language would just become natural to them. PLN has a retrieval grid, which is interactive. So you can find this in the scheme of work and each um, unit throughout the scheme, there's a, a link there which takes you through to a retrieval activity so ideally use these out of order mix it up a bit see whether the children can remember what was learnt in autumn one even though you're in summer term Michael Ward or HMI lead for languages says what's left in the sieve that's the, the phrase that he coined and it's a really great image of the fact that yes we might be um, throwing lots of content at the children throughout the year but what's actually still there that they can access stored in long term memory by the end of it. He also says retrieval practice strengthens memory and makes it easier to recall later and the basics need to be automated. I'm going to let you pause the video here it, just so you can read through at your own pace some of the key ways that we recommend that, that language is taught and practiced in the in the classroom. They're probably ideas that you've done and seen before, maybe not for a long time. So it might just um, just um, refresh your memory on some tried and tested games, which um, might just be something that you forgot about. But actually, they work really, really well. To add to that list, I know someone told me a, a while ago about the game Head to Head. So simple, but it's just something that I hadn't done. So now it's become part of my practice on a regular basis. So head to head is two children stood up who volunteer to, to have a go. You say the word in the target language and it's the first one to say it in English. And it's as simple as that. The one who gets it correct gets to stay standing and someone else repla replaces the second person. You can do that the, the other way around as well. So you could say the English and they could say the target language word. You could have a time limit for this activity and it's whoever's still standing by the end of that time limit, maybe 60 seconds, two minutes, and they're going to get the reward, whatever that happens to be. 
So let's look at those language detective skills then. As adults, we know them as transferable skills, but our super language detectives in our classes are going to be developing those skills that they can take with them to high school and beyond. And I call that their superpower. So tell them that, communicate that with them. These are their superpowers that will help them with any piece of language they are faced with. So the first strategy is, of course, to have a look for words they already know, words they've already learned. But sometimes children don't, don't realise this and they expect that they're going to have to use a dictionary to start with or to use a different strategy so just be really clear with them to to have a look first and to skim and scan to find words that they know already it might be color words it might be days of the week months of the year number words etc after that they're then going to look at cognate words and near cognate words so words that are the same or similar to english words or to any other heritage language words and then they're going to focus on the non-cognate words, so the words that aren't similar to words in English or another language they know. Those are the ones they're going to need to work out. So it might be that they skim and scan and use the context and think, well, this piece of writing is about food, so more than likely it might be a word to do with um, a piece of uh, an ingredient for uh, a recipe or an item of food or a word to do with making food. That would be what we call a good guess or an educated guess. Um, obviously, they need to be aware of false friends, what we call faux amis in French. So words that look like cognates, but actually mean something different and that's not something to shy away from that is part of language that's part of the quirk of all languages so it's just to be able to tell the children that we need to have a little bit of a filter when we're looking through language and not all cognates might be cognates final resort i always say a last resort is using a bilingual dictionary not because i'm shying away from that skill just because i know it's something that takes time to build confidence with and also there are so many other things that the children can be doing first if they got a dictionary out first and started to look up every word they'd be there all day so dictionary skills is something that you can really uh, press pause on your scheme of work for a couple of lessons to be able to embed first and we've got loads of ideas actually on um, a blog post of mine and um, all through the scheme of work on how to make best use of bilingual dictionaries as we've mentioned before, that memory and recall, and those skills that we, we use all the time, but about sharing those skills. So what? how do you remember that? How do you remember that? Sharing with their, their friends in class and helping each other learn. Language detective skills are also about listening, about speaking, reading, writing and being really obvious and saying, right, we're, we're practising our listening skills now or we're practising our pronunciation skills. Sometimes children are a little bit unclear on which skills we're actually developing in language lessons. Phonics awareness is, again, something that you can uh, put the brakes on and stop and, and teach discreetly or you can be assured that throughout the PLN scheme of work, phonics is covered as we go through it all. So there are tongue twisters in there, there are phonetic detectives activities, there are videos linked to making mouth shapes for key sounds in French and in Spanish. So don't worry about phonics. Phonics is something that actually children, that's how they learn to read in English nowadays. So they are used to differentiating between different phonemes and graphemes and how they link together to make words. So phonics awareness is great. I'll show you a couple of videos um, in a bit about what children um, can do to, to help themselves become more aware of phonics. Uh, but it might be that that's classed as one of your language detective skills as well. We've mentioned about speaking, whether that's the pronunciation of the words or the intonation. So whether the voice rises in a question or the, the kind of rhythm and the lilt of, of, of the the speaking if you're trying to imitate a native speaker sound file. For younger learners, a language detective skill could be as simple as turn taking. That could be in a game, passing something around the circle, um, taking turns having a go with something or taking turns in a conversation, which is a real social skill to learn. Taking a risk and not being afraid to make a mistake. We're coming right back to that growth mindset, to that having a go and um, fostering that culture where it's fine to make mistakes. Metacognition too, learning how we learn best, knowing what works for you and being proud of it. So you can see at the bottom here, this is our language detective certificate, which you'll find throughout our scheme of work. And on the right, you can see what I class as a uh, 
a really good language detective activity where the children are faced with a piece of language. It's about a tradition uh, to do with epiphany. So they've learnt about the tradition culturally first. So there's that cultural link. And then they, they look at the language. So they, they discuss what strategies they're going to use first. And that's the strategy of find what you know already. Then look for the cognates, near cognates, and then use context to work out the rest. And then bilingual dictionaries, finally. So I'm just going to play these videos now. These are year six children who are giving us their perspective of what language detectives is. So it's a phrase that we coin throughout the network, but lots of children will talk about language detectives and the, the skills that are involved. And this is their self-efficacy. So in year four, we made this sound wheel and it, it's really good because it helps me because I can look back to it. So some of the sounds I like are wah wah so i know it's a wah because it's was wazzle um and i look and i like ooh ooh in rouge and also it sh sh sheen shan shan in um in shan so yeah i think it really helps me if i look back at it to my sounds and how about when you see some new words on the board, how does this sound wheel help you? Uh, the sound wheel helps me because if, if it's like I um, always spot them and if it's um, weather again, it's an oh, oh, eh, but I always know because I look back at my sound wheel that it's a wah, wah sound. So basically what language detectives are, are basically when you spot um, something that you know or something that you've already seen in previous French lessons, you will put your hand up and Madame Wilson will ask you what your point is and then um, you will, if your point is right, then you will get a ticket and you would put it in the prize bag and then at the end of every term, um, about two one, two or three students to pick out of the prize bag and then whoever gets picked gets um, to pick out the prize box and then in the prize box are like French badges, bounty balls, sweets, stuff like that. So what you can do to get a language detective is if you put your hand up and you spot some of the keywords, you spot some sounds, you spot some of the cognates and semi-cognates, you spot anything like accents or any key stuff that we've learnt in previous French sessions you will um, so you will you'll get um, a raffle ra a ticket and if you're lucky you might get it picked out of the thing at the end of term out of the bag out of the bag yeah <laughs> look for in French is basically accents sounds I look for Masculine, oh, masculine and feminine words and anything that I've seen in previous French lessons or just that I know already. So what I love from that first video is the children themselves know exactly what's expected of them, what they're going to be awarded for. So that's them being really aware and having that metacognition about how they learn and what's going to improve their language. And in the second video, I, I love the way that, you know, it's not it's not absolutely perfect. And, and the pupil self-corrects, doesn't she? So she, she refers to looking back in her work. So that's her, that element of retrieval and recall, which she values clearly because it's something that helps her with her phonics wheel. But when she pronounces something she's not satisfied with the first attempt that she makes and she actually you know looks has another look and, and challenges herself to to improve improve that pronunciation i also just want to share with you here a snapshot of um, a unit of work called out of this world it's summer one stage three and um i've just moved myself so you can see the wonders that is um this id card here of uh, a, an extraterrestrial uh, person, an extraterrestrial um, 
alien so you can see here that the the child has looked back at what they've learned in their their food topic and decided that the actual alien comes from planet fromage from planet cheese and that their nationality is fromagian so i love the fact that they were retrieving words that they'd looked at uh, previously also with the written outcomes here you can see some labeling some reading and uh, designing so they're being reading detectives there they're reading a sentence and then they're making sure they're showing their understanding by drawing it accurately and the sentence work as well which will have come from um, some rainbow writing so as we saw at the beginning lots of rainbow writing structures throughout this unit which the children find really helpful when they come to write extended pieces of writing. I just want to show you one last video, which is a board game linked to this unit where the children have to count their way around the board in the target language. And when they land on a planet, they describe that planet in French, just following a very simple format of, for example, Mars is red. So there are three children featured in this video. It's a little bit tricky to hear because there's lots of active fun and, and, and enjoyment going on in the background. But the first person is quite confident, so she rolls the dice counts accurately and then says her sentence which is Uranus a uh, petite I think she says the second learner a little bit less uh, confident so he asks for help with the bits that he needs which was just the counting part but when it comes to saying the sentence he'd remembered what he needed to say the third learner really showed self-efficacy so he naturally start singing a counting song that we've been doing very regularly so you will hear him just count to the tune of Frère Jacques as he makes his way around the board <laughs> just a note about our uh, new and improved scheme of work. So you will see little symbols as you go through, for example, the speak symbol, the learn or reading symbol, the little retriever as well, who we call Fetch. So we've got language detective characters of Curio and Fetch, who um, are really keen language learners that just represent the children in your class. One's more curious about links with language. One's really keen to retrieve, hence the retriever, uh, what he can find and make those links straight away. So you'll see those throughout the scheme of work. That's in an attempt, a conscious attempt, to allow you to have that uh, discussion with the children about what skills are actually being worked on at the time. So on to our final section then, and we're really zooming out now into the kind of skills and the kind of experiences that we're affording our children when we teach languages. So cultural capital is something that all children deserve to, to have to improve life chances. And I think with language, you can't really separate words from the culture that they belong to. So you are naturally going to be delving into customs and cultures of different countries when you're teaching languages. To start with, that skill is going to be a compare and contrast with home cultures and home celebrations with the target language country. And that's absolutely fine and a great way in. We often say festivals, food, folklore, the key words which we, we tend to focus on and celebrations, things like Christmas and Easter and other times of the year. Um, but also really think about it from a more subtle um, perspective as well. So simple aspects of daily life. So what time people tend to get up, go to school, which days of the week they go to school on. Do they wear school uniform? Which lessons do they learn? School is a great topic, actually, for, for cultural capital because there's so much to learn from the different school systems that exist. Um, but I would just encourage you to think about the, the different ways that, that gestures and greetings work in different cultures, uh, which all make up that rich tapestry of what we, what we know and, and what we love about diversity. So there's awareness and understanding there, but there's also appreciation of cultures other than their own. And that's what we call cultural empathy. So cultural understanding is kind of the first step on that journey and really, really important and a lot of comparing and contrasting. And when we can, we want to be allowing our children that cultural empathy as well. So one example of that is 
to to encourage that that curiosity and that that appreciation and respect of diversity is quite simply Spanish playground games or any language playground games. It's something the children will do in their own language, in um, their own time, in their own playgrounds. But how great to be able to do that in a different language. So I know one, well, several schools that, that are part of the network have looked into this. They've, they've researched how to play the games. There are also links on our VLE to do with playground games. So do look there if you're interested. And it's something the children can be doing quite freely then at playtimes in their own time. They can go home and teach siblings and friends outside of school. And what's great about this was it was actually um, a written outcome. So the children were writing the rules for the game. That was then converted to a video outcome by the use of QR codes. So it was really um, a great way of embracing culture through language as well. If you have international links, then that is absolutely fantastic and a great way into cultural capital to be able to compare and contrast and ask those questions and share those experiences. If not, the next best thing we always say is to have a link with a school in the UK that learns the same language that you do. And that's a, um, a pairing um, opportunity that we offer at PLN so that's something you're interested in we're happy to to, to make those links with the different school in the UK um, if you're thinking of improving that that cultural awareness and cultural empathy then what I would say is to start quite simply so to not worry about coming off timetable for entire days or weeks just yet uh, maybe build up to that but just think about um, the, the kind of simple things the day-to-day -day, the customs the greetings Always bearing in mind that we we need to avoid stereotypes, um, and it, it sometimes is down to the kind of language we we use in English. So, saying things like "most people might" rather than implying that all people do. Um, consider as well those lesser known countries or lesser known traditions and customs that are linked to the target language. And whatever you are able to achieve, celebrate that via your school social media, via the school newsletter, via the website. Be really proud of what links you're able to make. There is a Global Dimension calendar released every academic year. So you can Google that and you can kind of cross reference and see if there's a specific celebration day on that that links to something that you're learning with, learning about it within your curriculum already. And just to share two examples, which I absolutely love, which really epitomise that cultural capital for me, quite subtle, but really, really meaningful. So the first one is something that uh, we've developed at PLN. You can get access to this in French and Spanish. And it's about something that children really care about. So when they start to lose their teeth, who comes for the teeth? Is it a tooth fairy or is it in fact the tooth mouse? So in France, in particular, it's la petite souris. So it's the tooth mouse and they um, have a little box that they put their teeth in possibly and they might write a note. So even just that awareness is so interesting for children and really great for their cultural understanding. And this final project, which I'm really proud that we were part of. So September time last year, around the European Day of Languages time, um, you will know if you're part of the network that we did a huge focus on the cultural project called The Walk, which was um, Amal, who is this huge puppet that walked from Syria all the way through Europe to the UK. And um, I think even has even more pertinence now with what's happening in Ukraine. So children were able to think about what it meant to be a refugee and the kind of emotions and feelings and experiences that uh, refugees go through. So it just so happened at the time we were learning about uh, expressing how you felt and why. So that linked perfectly with having the empathy for refugees such as Amal and all the, the, the children that have been through this. I love the fact that even though it's written in English, this child has expressed their opinions. I think Amal felt triste when she left Syria because she'd left her country. I think Amal will feel feliz when she arrives in Manchester because she'll be making a lot of new friends. So an activity such as this is so powerful in terms of what we're trying to instill in our children. Children need to know why we're learning languages, especially as they grow up and go to secondary school. They need to know where languages can actually take you. And I love this display. It was taken from a secondary school, actually, during COVID, where people weren't physically traveling very much at all. 
But the, the idea of learning languages and the skills that you get from language learning can really take you anywhere you want to go. It can be travel, meeting different people, it can be work and career opportunities, the chance to learn other languages. So something like that might just be a really useful focus for your children. Again, we're thinking really wide now, but the kind of investment that languages uh, deserves, if you like, so a pound of extra investment investment in languages provision could actually make a return of two pounds for our UK economy. So even without thinking about further afield, thinking about home turf, thinking about the fact that I think it was Cambridge University again has researched that over the course of about 30 years with this kind of investment in languages, it could increase UK GDP by something like billions of pounds. So it's, there's so many reasons to learn languages, so many reasons why we need to be giving our children these opportunities and so many benefits to be had from them as well. As we finish then, I've just given you a few questions to, to point you in the direction of a bit of a reflection. So you might want to pause here and maybe make some notes or even better, engage in the chat about this session so that there can be... Um, uh, a, a dialogue between practitioners about things that you know um, are going to work in your classroom when you get back to class, how you can better support children to become more independent with their language learning, more effective language learners, or anything that you feel you still struggle with and will still need support with. So no doubt there'll be somebody out there who can help. Um, also about cultural capital. So how are you thinking now you're going to be increasing your children's cultural capital through primary languages provision? That brings us to the end of my session. So thank you so much for listening and taking the time out to reflect on the things that we've talked about. Uh, by all means, get in touch, kate at primarylanguages.network if, um, if we can help any further. Look out for as well, there's going to be a takeaway sheet linked to this session with all the key points on there. And also we're going to be releasing a series of blog posts about those self-efficacy strategies as well. So look out on the Primary Languages Network website on the first page, on the home page, scroll right to the bottom and that's where, where you'll find our blog, which is open to all. So I hope you enjoy the rest of the week. I'm certainly looking forward to everything else that's coming up this week and thank you once again. Bye bye. <laughs>